So, um, in April this year, uh, the use of real-time prescription monitoring system SafeScript became mandatory for all clinicians involved in prescribing or dispensing high-risk medications. So for many patients and their clinicians, this highlighted how important it is to have a, uh, this is, sorry, this is starting to start to relieve the complexity of living with chronic pain and has highlighted how important it is to have a comprehensive treatment plan, including broader strategies for pain management rather than just medication. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic further complicated this situation, um, especially in Victoria, as I'm sure we've all heard, there are strong indications that we're going to see a surge of mental health issues as our population experiences the effects of loneliness and isolation, compounded by the social distancing restrictions, which have really impeded people in their ability to seek help. Uh, one in five Australians experience chronic pain. 40% of general practice consultations for adults cite chronic pain as the reason. If we're going to have any hope of improving these statistics, we need to recognise the psychosocial factors which influence a patient's experience of chronic pain, which influence their chance of developing chronic pain, and which influence their risk of opioid misuse. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we'll hear from our expert speakers about the biopsychosocial model of chronic pain, approaches used in physiotherapy for the management of relapse and flare-ups, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy and other psychological approaches, the place of pharmacotherapy in addressing comorbid substance dependence in chronic pain, and how social prescribing can address uh, negative health outcomes which have been compounded by loneliness. So, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, if I can. Um, Jack Beanie is a senior pain physio at St. Vincent's Barbara Walker Centre for Pain here in Melbourne. He works with a broad range of pain conditions and tries to focus on encouraging curiosity in the people he sees, coaching them to explore their pain journeys and conceptualizations. Jack likes brewing beer and bicycling, although lockdown has forced him to do a little bit too much of the former. So challenge for attendees, see if you can spot where Jack has worked these themes into his clinical communication. Jack is presenting tonight about how to use pain crises as opportunities to reframe people's pain experiences and set them on a path to less distress and disability. I hand it over to you, Jack. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, so, um, hi, I'm Jack. Um, let me pull up my presentation and then you will lose the, the shot of me, which I've spent the last half an hour setting up the lighting for. So, um, thanks for having me along, Adrian. Um, so, Adrian's given me about 15 minutes uh, to talk about um, flare-ups and looking at, at pain. Um, not just in terms of what physios do, or I'm going to look at, but um, in terms of um, looking at pain kind of from a more broad, broad perspective um, and throw the word biopsychosocial around, which we, we lose our jobs if we don't throw it around enough in, a, in one of these seminars. Um, I've got 15 minutes, which is kind of, you know, we're thinking about primary care. That's often, that's often all we have um, to, to communicate with our, our patients, our, our clientele, about what they're going through. So hopefully what I want to present tonight isn't necessarily a deep um, explanation of everything about pain. You know, that, would, that wouldn't do it justice um, in 15 minutes, but hopefully look at, you know, the ways that I look to describe and talk about pain um, to my, my clients and my, my patients and the people I work with um, so that you might be able to share some of the words I say or some of the things I do. Um, as Adrian said, um, I am the senior pain physio at, at the Barbara Walker Centre in St. Fees in Fitzroy. <clears throat> I have underlined phys pain physiotherapists because we are actually um, a special breed of physios. We, we have titling and specialisation pathways in, in the physio profession now that there are actually physios out there who are specialised and specifically trained for pain, um, just like there are musculoskeletal or neurological physios. Um, and and that'll come, that's kind of important down the track. Um, the Barbara Walker Centre is a multidisciplinary clinic, one of the better funded and, and better staff for, um, multidisciplinary pain clinics. Um, we see a, a, between about 400 to 600 new patients a year. Um, and the biggest thing we do is a, is a series of different um, intensive um, group programs um, that work on a lot of CBT based kinds of things, but also broadly looking at reconceptualization of pain and, and the rehab that follows that. 
Um, if you want to send me an email, you can always contact me on that. So there's two, um, two key ideas that I want to come to. One is I want to use the opportunity to talk about flare-ups um, because it is in, in crises and, and times when, when pain flares up that we might feel that the need to, to take certain courses of action treatment because uh, the, the patient who comes to us is, is in distress um, and they're looking for help, they're looking for answers in the moment um, and that can be often when we make decisions that affect them long term um, and so looking at how we can reframe and, and look at, look at flare-ups a little bit differently because these are times for learning. And the second part is, is actually how we do approach that. And, and I wanna change the question. And I'm gonna come back to this, and this does give away the entirety of my presentation, but looking more at the question, am I safe? Um, rather than necessarily the typical questions that we ask of pain. So I've been given the task of, of kind of talking about pain as a, as a biopsychosocial construct. And, and as I said, this isn't something we can really cover in depth um, in, the, in this time, but I'm actually using a metaphor that a, a patient kind of gave to me. So we often think about, you know, mo everyone knows what biopsychosocial means and it's starting to look at things across the spectrum, contributors to pain. Um, and we often think about it like you've got a, a dance hall and you've got lots of little dancers doing their, their own things. And we can see these as maybe the, the biological ones, the, the psychological ones and the social ones. And we, we, we might be able to start looking at pain with these different things um, as, as separate and almost unique. Um, we, can, we can put them in holes. Unfortunately, really to truly look at pain biopsychosocially, it's more of a mosh pit. Um, and we need to consider that pain, there isn't a true biological contributor. There isn't a true psychological contributor. There isn't a true social contributor. Or if you know we start to expand the BPS language as these cultural and, and other aspects they're adding to the, the, the letters these days. To think that pain, everything is mushed in together like a mosh pit, that there are different uh, contributors that are all interacting with each other. None of them fit into a particular biopsychosocial pigeonhole um, and that, you know, there's a lot of things that change and interact and, and play with that. Um, one example I like to think of, and, and you know, I often hear, particularly our, our pain trainees, they talk about the bio and they're gonna work on the bio by giving someone potentially a medication for their pain. And yes, we know that these lovely little pills that I drew, um, let's pretend they're, they're an opioid of some description. So we know that biologically, they're gonna work at the, the mu opioid receptor that might inhibit you know, transmission of nociception and the dorsal horn. Um, and we can say that's a purely biological effect. Um, but then we can even then step back and look at the, it is a psychological thing because um, we know that expectation, placebo, all these kinds of things affect the efficacy of all our drugs, all our interventions, all our interactions. Um, but then even, you know, we look at behaviourally and how does that, how does that affect their, their coping with pain as they, as they use medications and they use, they use things to help their pain from an external point of view as they, you know, potentially may, and I'm not, not necessarily here to demonise medication. I'll let my other panellists do that. Um, uh, but so, we're, we're, you know, we're looking at that there is a behavioural aspect to even just taking, taking a medication. So we know that there, there's more to it than this, what we might think of as a purely biological um, intervention, but it has a broad, broad range of perspectives. And then obviously, because we, we know all about opioids and, and, and medication like that, that there are cultural implications with taking medications like this. So um, we can't say that anything necessarily sits purely in the bio, nothing sits perfectly in the psycho, um, and nothing definitely sits perfectly in the social as these, these lines get blurry. So as we think about pain, we need to think about it in terms of everything kind of mushed in together um, as we kind of explore this experience of pain. So I like to look at more pain, more like an iceberg, um, when, and when we're looking at, at someone comes in. So coming from the perspective of someone having a flare up and a, a, an, an exacerbation of their pain, let's say, but also when we think about flare ups, we can also look at, you know, when we start to broadly look at things, it might also be a new bout of say back pain or, or a headache or something like that, that, that actually is not, not always something we need we might culturally designate it as something that relates to an injury, but as we learn more and more about it, it seems to be more like a pain condition. But we look at a flare up like an iceberg and we say that, yeah, there might be this situation that the pain happens after maybe we're bending over in the bathroom 
Um, and so in, in the clinical interaction, we could explore that and talk about um, the, the pain bending, which way were you bending, how much were you bending, and all those things. And they're good clinical interactions. They're important things to, to do. Um, but the big thing is, is, is working biopsychosocially, particularly when we're limited in time, um, you know, it might be also what else is going on, you know, what else has been happening? And this isn't rocket science, this isn't anything new. Um, but sometimes it is just actually exploring, starting to look at, okay, what, what else is happening? For someone to bend over, um, which is a, a perfectly safe activity, you know, we backs don't fall apart, backs aren't things that explode when we, when we do um, an activity like bending over. Um, why is it suddenly caused so much pain? So we have to look at, you know, what else is going on to make this person's pain system so reactive, so overprotective, so um, reflexively over, you know, freaking out. Um, and often, you know, we, we start to start to uncover some extra things. And, and even by just talking about some of the things that are going on with, with people's pain, they start to realize that these things might have a, uh, an effect. And these are maybe some things that people have said um, it might just have been a couple of late nights at the office and there's a bit of extra stress and um, there might actually be approaches that people are um, actually taking to cope with that that stress um, which can interact um, and as we talk a bit more we might open up that there are even more things that are going on um, you know the big ones that we look at are probably sleep in terms of how that affects recovery from from acute episodes of say back pain stress work hours, things like that. And probably in particularly right now, and probably most people working in primary care will have really experienced the stress that it kind of goes on at the moment with this extra edge that, that everyone's experiencing as they come in with any kind of flare up at the moment is all the, the nonsense that's going on with the stress around COVID and, and homeschooling and all these threats. So by exploring these kinds of things, um, this is, you know, reasonably easy things to do. It might take a little bit more time to, to talk about these things, but it's just kind of opening up the patient's experience to seeing what else is affecting their, their pain and what is underneath the um, iceberg. And sometimes bringing that into, into focus for patients to see that that is part of their picture. You know, it's not necessarily that we see when we look biopsychosocially that we have this and these things just affect our coping. Um, but rather we actually see these all as the one part of the pain. You know, this isn't just contributors as a, as a, as things that affect, you know, our, our way of actually looking at pain. These actually affect the pain itself. And we look at things that contributing to pain. Sometimes people say, well, there's nothing else going on. Um, and that can be really tricky. You know, we have maybe some people who present quite closed books. Um, and I don't always have the answers to, for these, these kinds of experiences when people say that there's nothing going on. But the other way to look at it is that more metaphors, and I'm trying to segue these into one another. Um, there's, there's some relationship between ice and, and the glass here. Um, but the, another way we can look at it, and we can look at a flare-up and, and talking about a flare-up with, with a, um, a patient or a person in pain, we look at pain not only um, as, you know, if we can imagine that, that pain is, is this, like this cup, you know, when this cup overflows, so things that contribute to our pain, like our things underneath our iceberg, you know, these things contribute to our pain, eventually the cup overflows. Um, and we can look at these additive things that, that contribute to our experience of pain. And when the cup overflows, um, we might have a flare up or we might have an acute bout of, of something or other. The big thing is, is that's not the only thing that determines whether the cup overflows, is how many much you put in the cup. Um, the cup also can overflow if something makes the cup smaller. And so we can also conceptualize pain in terms of, yes, the things inside the cup contribute, uh, are the contributors, but also our ability to cope, our ability to balance out these threats, these dangers, um, or our co coping strategies, frame the size of the cup. And so sometimes things happen. So nothing's necessarily happened to increase our um, level of stress or level of threat. The things have happened to our coping strategies or maybe something's taken away or a certain social outlet that has been keeping us happy and feeling safe, um, it suddenly is gone. So that we can recognize that particularly when people come and say nothing's really changed, nothing's added is, is that pain can flare up, not just from increases in load, threat, danger, pathology, but from a reduction in coping resilience or something like that. 
you know, and often we see this is that you know, people who flare up um, or have or have pain that's suddenly increased, it's often they've been dealing with the problem for a long time and then a, a chink in the arm or, or a chip breaks away and suddenly the dam bursts and, and we flare up. And so it's not necessarily a new thing. It might present like a new issue. Um, it's been something that's been building up for a while and this is just the, the dam wall crashing down. This idea of looking at pain both from the the balance of contributors versus that that idea of the things that, that make us feel safe and balanced out is kind of the, the main theme of the, the kind of dims and sims model. So I'll, I'll refer to if you want to really explore this and actually get you know, patients, sorry if I keep saying participants, I'm in the middle of a very intensive group program at the moment. Um, you might see that patients gel with this idea is that they can actually go out and find this book. And it's a really helpful book to start looking at that balance. Um, and they, you know, David Butler and, and Laura Mosley talk about dims and sims and dangers of safeties and we look at the balance um, and sometimes it is about not so much about extra things going wrong um, but more sometimes the, the safeties, these, these things that are great in our life that balance us out, sometimes when they disappear, you know, the carpet gets pulled from under us. So the second part of talking about flare-ups and actually framing what do we do from here is actually having a look at the questions we ask in the heat of the moment. Um, so the probably the, you know, if we look at the biopsychosocial model and, and what it aims to replace this kind of typical pathoanatomical, particularly if we're talking about musculoskeletal pain, this biomedical approach where we want to find something and fix it. The leading question when someone's in a crisis is what have I done? Um, and what have I done is, is kind of a, a, um, a very leading, you know, it's a very difficult question to answer sometimes. I actually remember when I was working in private practice, there used to be these practice, build your practice guides, um, and they'd actually train the um, receptionist when they answered the phone to actually ask the, the person calling to make an appointment to ask, oh, what have you done? Just to really kind of get them in and, and get them going. And, and, and now, now I reflect on that, and obviously I'm going to tell us a, where maybe we should pursue a different way. I look at how harmful just the way we structure our clinics can be um, to people experiencing pain. So the problem with leading a response to pain um, with the what have I done kind of approach is that it really does reinforce fear and worry. And often with particularly with persistent pain um, and you know, with, with people who have had a flare up, there isn't an obvious path pathology or specific incident or something that's gone wrong. Um, so sometimes there's, there's this expectation that, that something's gone wrong. There's expectation of imaging because that's, that might be how they've been treated in the past. Um, but often that imaging doesn't resolve anything too obvious, which leads to more frustration, more scans, more, more chasing, trying to find answers. Um, despite the best um, ways of, you know, we're, we're all on top of talking about imaging, particularly with pain, and, and that a lot of things we see in imaging aren't necessarily a cause of pain, um, it does frame it still as an expectation. If we're looking for an injury or a piece of harm, asking what have I done reinforces rest and avoidance. Um, you know, the behaviours are going to be around um, trying to avoid the thing that we've done. For example, the, the bending over in the bath, which is a safe activity, it's not a harmful thing to do. Um, taking a what have I done approach means that that person never bends over in the, to pick their kid out of the bath ever again. And that, that affects their entire life. Um, and things can escalate as a result of that. You know, as a result, their disability escalates, their, dis, um, their distress escalates. But the big thing is, is this fits in really well culturally. This is so easy to talk about and, and chase into, say, okay, we're going to look and find out what's, what's the root cause of your pain often is how it's framed. The alternative we want to say is, okay, am I safe to move or am I safe? Um, pain's primary role is to protect us. Um, so if it's overreacting, we can't trust it as a protector. So we kind of have to reframe the questions and cognitively discuss, am I actually safe, rather than rely on our you know, overreactive response. This is the big challenge in pain education and, and everything we do is we want to reassure someone to tell them, hey, it's going to be okay, but still acknowledge what you know, the challenges they're going through. Um, you know, typical kind of old looks at, at talking to people about chronic pain is to tell them there's nothing wrong with them, it's just chronic pain. Um, and that they can kind of move on and get on and keep going and things like that. And that can be quite dismissive. Um, people 
can perceive that we're telling them it's all in their head or something like that. So we can actually have a look at you, know, come back from the functional perspective of pain and ask, am I safe to move? And if we can reassure them, yes, you are, you know, something's happened, but you're safe to go on. Um, we can encourage active approaches. You know, it's better than, it's a better way to look at, yeah, this is happening, it's awful, but you are safe to, you know, do what you can over the next couple of weeks. Um, it does open room for discussion around these contributors, these things that sit underneath the iceberg. Um, and by, by clearing and, and looking from a screening point of view rather than a diagnosis point of view, a screen and let them, let them heal kind of point of view, particularly with, with flare-ups or musculoskeletal pain especially, um, it, it takes away a lot of the pressure of having to find out what's wrong. But admittedly, that pressure is still there. It's, it's still a cultural expectation of the person distressed, distressed to get an x-ray. So this isn't easy to change practice and talk about this straight away. Um, so how do we know someone's safe to move? And simply enough, it is, as I said, it's like screening. If we can screen out red flags that there isn't anything super nasty, you know, infection, trauma, cancer, and huge neurological deficit, um, we can generally, particularly with things like back pain and musculoskeletal pain, but even widespread pains, um, and I know that probably the physicians amongst the audience would be able to better know ways to screen abdominal pain and, and pelvic pain and headaches. Um, but we, we can re reasonably well screen and, and we have really good guidelines around generally um, red flags and, and screening for the really nasty things. And from that perspective, then usually is that we can see that the benefits of staying active or taking an active approach to our pain outweigh the costs. You know, if we sit still for the next six weeks until that pain goes away, what's the cost of that to the, the person experiencing pain? And so the, the conversation then might come is that, yeah, and this sounds really rigid because I've written this into a PowerPoint presentation, um, but it, you know, we can acknowledge, hey, you've, you've done something pretty, pretty well, you've done a good job of your back here. You know, we've talked about things, you know, those movements I just did, they're great, everything seems to be working. Your back's not perfect, but it is safe to keep going and actually movement's going to be better for you. Um, let's have a talk of what else is going on in your life, if you're happy, um, and, and maybe what else can we do to maximise how your body heals. How are you sleeping? How's your stress? How's the relationship with the kids at the moment? Having a look at those things. Um, it definitely, by talking about am I safe to move, it's definitely not telling people to suck it up and soldier on. Um, it's nothing to worry about, should be right. And this is, these are kind of quite dismissive um, and we don't acknowledge and, and respect the person in pain. Um, so hopefully, clearly I've written that this is a red screen and don't say these things. Um, because it's not the impression we want to, we want to give. <sighs> so generally, if we, if we can screen out red flags, we can encourage activity and, and we can start to have that conversation about starting to manage their contributing practice. And this won't work. This probably won't work for the first couple of people we, we, we try this approach with. Uh, and it won't work for probably most to start with because it is a very different from cultural ways. Um, but if we start asking the questions about, you know, what else is going on, what else is contributing to this, and we all start asking those questions in, in kind of all aspects, um, and then the, you know, the person experiencing pain seems to be always up getting asked these questions, then it can seem to make a change. Um, that being said, every now and, you know, every now and again, it does happen that we start to get change, and, and change is happening with how we look at these acute, particularly acute flare-ups of, of, of persisting pain, and even acute back pain and things like that, that we can change. Um, and there's nothing wrong with if we have screened um, for red flags and we know that there isn't anything, emer nothing too emergent, nothing that requires emergency treatment, um, we can reinforce it, that we can catch up in a wait and see and reassure the, the, the patient that we can catch up in a week or two. Um, but by encouraging that they're safe to move, they can hopefully reduce their distress and keep going. If we want to refer someone, it, it's probably really helpful that we can refer them to someone saying the same things, talking about safety, talking about that, you know, that they are, they have a solid body that can heal itself, that can work itself. Um, and then that might be actually going away from their previous um, referrer. So if you've been sending someone to the same physio for 10 years and they keep hearing the same thing, it might be time to mix it up. And that's where I'll say that pain clinics are definitely not a last resort. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. And quite frankly, we, we 
much, much prefer seeing people um, early on in their, their pain journey rather than that. They've exhausted every single type of specialist and they have a, um, a list of previous referrals to every other department at St. V's before they come to us. So the kind of reinforcement is that the two key ideas is that things are always, there are always things that are happening underneath the iceberg. And by changing our question and looking at um, things differently, by asking new questions, we might not always be able to change it, but by changing the, the equation to, am I safe to move rather than what have you done? Um, we can make a big difference in how people perceive their flare up and, and move forward with their pain. If you want some resources that you wanna share with your patients, once again, I think that most resources should be applicable to both clinicians and, um, and patients, but this is in order from probably more towards patients and the, a much more universal thing. Um, so Tame the Beast has a great video and there's a couple of other great YouTube pain education videos online um, by Joshua Pate and there's a great Laura Mimosley TEDx video, that book I re referenced earlier. Permission to Move is fantastic. It's a, it's a book by a physio that kind of explores the safe to move concept. Um, and it involves not only a, a clinical manual for people in primary care, um, but also there's an online course that patients can do. That's a six week program. That's actually, it seems expensive at $200, but it's actually really, really quite valuable. And we've, I've seen some amazing change in the last couple of months. ANSCA do a better pain management, better pain prescribing online module that really goes into the IASP curriculum about BPS and, and um, it's free if you're a prescriber. And if you're really serious about it and really interested in the pain, I recommend the University of Sydney postgraduate program, um, or you can go to the University of South Australia. Um, and that's all I have. How do we do the questions, Adrian? So 